Well, I, I should thank the society for the opportunity to participate in this debate. It is an interesting one, and Jeff's put me in a position where I have to talk against reimplantation. So I'll provide a contrarian view to that of my normal practice, and uh, we'll see how we get on from there. So what's the principles behind reimplantation? Let's just look at that carefully first. So it is to restore the anatomy of the aortic root. You want to realign the commissural posts after you've resected the aneurysm because the posts look very different after you've dealt with it. We've got to remember that we're talking about connective tissue disorder patients, and particularly with reference to Marfan's and Lewis Dietz patients. They have a flask-like structure as you go into the root, and once you've taken the aneurysm out, the commissural posts need to be put where they need to be. You've got to fix the basal annulus with annular reduction if required, unless you've got in very early where the annulus is not distended out yet. And you've got to ensure even an appropriate cusp height, and that is essential for long-term results. So before I get into reimplantation versus remodeling, let's just rewind back a bit. You've got a systematic review of nearly 3,000 Marfan patients that's been published uh, quite up to date now in the Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery, uh, looking at nearly half and half composite valve grafts and valve sparing aortic root replacements, this being both remodeling and reimplantation. And valve sparing aortic root replacement has less risk of thromboembolism, hemorrhage, endocarditis, and has no increase in reintervention rates. So before we start splitting hairs about one versus the other, we should realize that it is a very good operation to save the valve, and the long-term results are very encouraging. And if you look at the comparisons between reimplantation and remodeling, I've got Dr. David's paper up there and a summary of the systematic review done by Umberto. And essentially, they are showing that in connective tissue disorder patients, the reimplantation technique has got more long-term durability than remodeling. Uh, so this is at the outset. And let's just look at the uh, reimplantation versus remodeling outcomes. Um, I didn't purposefully put up too many graphs because I knew that Professor Schaefer will be putting them up already. So he's shown you that in terms of the data that Dr. Davids uh, published, the long-term results are good, but you can see that remodeling is a little bit less in terms of durability compared to reimplantation. One must not forget that that includes this early series of patients as well, when he was in the learning curve of remodeling. And we'll come to that uh, a bit few down the line, why it could have had an important impact. So is it art or science? We hear a lot of discussions going on about the David operation and how and why and the different tweaks that need to be done to it. Commissural post orientation. Well, how simple is that to do? To estimate the appropriate height in the corrected root anatomy. I say corrected root because once you've resected all the aneurysm tissue and you've got the floppy commissural posts, where it's going to lie in the true root, neo root that you're going to create requires a little bit of thinking. It is uncommon to have variations, you know, and it's not always 120 degrees clockwise orientation. If you look at the cusps and the commissures after you resected it, and if you hold it in alignment, and I generally tend to use the normal valve holders because it's got a nice 120 degree orientation, you do quite often see a 110, 130 degree variation. Now that may seem little, but if you were to move those into the 120 that is your comfort zone for anatomy, you are in line to produce neoprolapse from having moved the commissures from where they should be. And of course, the height of the commissures are different. The left-right commissure is the shortest in height near the pulmonary infundulum. And the next one is your non-left. And the last one is going to be your left non, where it is free. So you've got a three-dimensional structure that needs to be put back in a three-dimensional orientation. One needs a little bit of thinking that needs to go into it if you're going to put it into a cylinder or a flasked cylinder, 
which is the Valsalva graft. And the next one is the annular base fixation sutures. Now, everybody talks about annuloplasty as if it's a simple thing to do. It is, in most cases, if your root anatomy is OK. But your suture placement has to be tailored to individual root anatomy. And this is even more important in connective tissue disorders, particularly in Marfan patients and lowest needs patients, where you will see that the cusps and the nadders can dive deep down. The non-right commissure area, Dr. Miller Stanford uh, described it very elegantly quite a few years ago, that if you're going to be taking your annuloplasty sutures, beware, because you're not far from the tricuspid annulus in that place. The next thing is, as you move over to the right ventricular outflow tract, you've got the right coronary cusp area. Again, as uh, Professor Schaffers was allu alluding to earlier, the right ventricular muscle, it can be a dog. And you've got to be careful there, because sometimes it's not so easy to fix. And I'll come back to that a bit more in a couple of slides. And of course, which type of graft to use, and how do you adapt this to varied anatomy? Do you use a cylindrical graft? Do you use it correctly sized? Do you oversize it and plicate it? This is something that has actually bothered Dr. David over the years. And in Stanford, Dr. Miller put it nicely as David 1 to David 5. That's because he wanted to keep up with Dr. David's thought process as it went over the years. And it's quite right that he's classified it in such a way so that people can understand which bit of the David operation we're talking about. And if you're going to use a Valsalva graph, and that's Ruggiero de Paulus that came up with that idea because of the issues that were purported with the valve cusps hitting against the cylindrical graft, how do you tailor it? You know? And what is the height of the Valsalva component that will go against the left right commissure as opposed to the left non. This is very important because blindly putting a Valsalva graft will not do the trick. So I thought it's always easy to talk with some images rather than slides. So that is, this is a 24-year-old Marfan. So you've got the non-coronary cusp there. That's the line there, and you're dissecting quite down. And this particular patient, I put it up because it was fairly deep going in. That's your left atrial roof. That's your right atrium. And it's not too difficult to go and go into the tricuspid annulus if you're not careful there. And that is the right coronary margin. And of course, the cusp is there. And you've got the free wall of the aorta. Again, if you pull it forward, you can see that in this particular patient, it is not much of a problem getting in there. But you can get into the right ventricular muscle if you're not careful. And of course, all these dissections are important when you get your cylindrical graft in. And unlike Professor Schaefer's, I'm not an expert without the water. I do put it in, but it is not to test the pressure. It is for me to see that the cusps are aligning up properly. And if I just put a little bit of water in, I know that the cusps have aligned up properly, and I can see the sign. And in fact, I have not finished off the uh, inflow suturing, and you can see that the valve is going to be all right. But essentially, that element of dissection gives you an insight into why the aortic root will be different in different patients, especially in connective tissue disorders. So you cannot standardize the David operation in as much as you'd like to do it. And this is another important thing to take into account. George Matalanis described this with a picture very nicely. And there's a lot of bench work done on this by Laurent uh, de Koshoff with uh, Professor El Khoury, looking at the various depths to which these commissures uh, can dive in. And if you look at the schematic picture, which I've adapted from the Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery, you can see that this is quite deep. And if you don't dissect the right ventricular muscle off properly, and you take oblique sutures, you're going to induce asymmetric annual, annuloplasty causing cusp torsion and neoprolapse. So dissection of the root is very, very important. Now, the reason I've gone into all these intricate details in reimplantation is to probably, it's also helped me look at it introspectively because I do this operation, but to know that there are limitations to doing this operation in all subsets. So the potential concerns. 
non-physiological cusp mobility. Again, you saw that uh, nice video that Professor Schaefer has produced. So you get abrupt closure of the valve and opening and reimplantation, rather than something that meets like this and then moves in and comes out. And that is because this movement comes with the vortices that form in the sinuses of the aortic root. And if you take it out and you remodel it in such a fashion that you've only left the cusps in there, they move like this. And so the concern was, could that be causing long-term valve durability problems? Now, because Dr. David's produced this outstanding results, that's all been put to rest, but this was quite a subject of discussion in the early years about the David operation. And of course, this potential for cusp wear and tear in contact with the Dacron wall. And to alleviate that to some extent, the Dipolis graft came in. And as we just discussed, the potential for asymmetric annuloplasty. And the increased graft stiffness. Kunzelman uh, and a group of uh, engineers looked at the stiffness of the graft within a cylinder, and it is quite extraordinary how much it is in compared to a remodeled route. But all this has not actually impacted on long-term durability in Dr. David's hands. Of course, that's all the references. So, in a sense, there are nuances to achieving good outcomes with a reimplantation procedure. So, why would a remodeling procedure be better? Reimplantation is clearly, you know, putting the whole thing into a cylinder. In remodeling, you have the co commissures that have got the Dacron sewn on, and you could add the annuloplasty ring to support the annulus. Um, now, in connective tissue disorders, I would strongly be in favor of supporting the annulus. This becomes more important if you have a annular dilatation starting off, or even in Marfan's, if it hasn't started off, there is no guarantee that it would not occur in the later decades of life. And if you have an annulus that is more than 25 millimeters, would very strongly favor supporting it. So the evidence for remodeling. I knew that Professor Schaefer will be giving a very detailed talk. So I've made it a one slide, but I will talk about it in as much as I can. So preoperative root geometry and postoperative cusp configuration determines long-term outcomes after valve spiring aortic root replacement. This is from his own paper I'm quoting this. Now, I place a lot of emphasis on this point of preoperative root geometry. You need to know what the root geometry is so that, you know, need the, so that you know where you'll end up with. And it is one of these operations you need to know in your mind what the end is going to be like before the beginning. And cusp configuration. Now, this is very important. Appropriate correction of the aortic cusp height. Again, the assessment of effective height, which is so nicely described, and the adjustment of free margin length is very important. And in fact, a lot of the operations with the remodeling that Dr. David had performed those days did not involve cusp height adjustment. And clearly, uh, in my discussions with him, he has actually said that that might have made a difference in his long-term data. And from Professor Schaefer's, I have learned this, and I have incorporated that into my practice, even though I do reimplantation. I try to get a cusp effective height, which is very satisfactory. And I think he's picked the number of nine, probably that gives you a, well, a number well over six, which is at least what you should have to achieve a good craftation height. Annular fixation. Lansac has come up with the idea of a flexible external annuloplasty because he thinks that you should preserve the aortic root dynamics while you support it and not allow it to enlarge. I kind of understand the philosophy behind that. And Professor Schaefer says that he prefers to use um, annular reduction with PTFE sutures. I think initially he did some internal circumferential sutures and now he looks at it externally. But there is a general agreement that you should do something to the annulus to prevent it from dilating in 
Marfan and Lewis did patients. So, and this is from his own data that he showed early on. If you did add an annuloplasty, it probably looks a lot better compared to not adding an annuloplasty. And that is an important message to take. So the way to look at this is, finally, it's all coming together. We're all talking from the same sheet, just from different angles. You need to support the annulus. You need to adjust the cusp height. And you need to be able to provide a stable route. And provided these can be done, you could do it with reimplantation, as Dr. David has shown us very elegantly, and you can certainly do it with remodeling. And I call this modified remodeling because you've added in a couple of nuances, which is making sure the cusp is right and making sure the annulus is fixed. Because if we kept saying remodeling, everyone goes back to the old data and assumes that they're all the same. So I propose that we call this modified remodeling, and it would probably make things much clearer. So to conclude, remodeling preserves physiological flow dynamics and aortic cusp mobility patterns similar to that of a native valve. Remodeling is a reproducible technique with less need for art than science. And in combination with cusp repair and basal annular fixation in dilated annuli, especially in Marfan Lowenstein's group of patients, it has long-term durable results which Professor Schaefer's has certainly produced, and it is similar to that of reimplantation. And if you look at Dr. David's curves, after 10 years, there isn't an awful lot of change. So really, we have data coming up to 10 years with remodeling with annular support, and I'm pretty sure that in 20 years, this result will go on. Thank you.